My name is Tom Stewart. I'd like to welcome you to the workshop, Male Sexual Health After Transplant. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Christian Nelson. Dr. Nelson is the Chief of the Psychiatry Service and an Associate Attending Psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He specializes in psychological treatments for men who experience sexual dysfunction following cancer treatments. He works to help men and their partners optimize intimacy before, during, and after transplant. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nelson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you for having me, and thank you um, for those who are logged on, and, and hopefully this is an informative presentation, and certainly you've got time to enter questions in the chat, and we'll try to make sure there's enough time at the end to answer a good, a good amount of those questions. So I'm uh, happy to be here and looking forward to presenting. And so... Um, and so important to this presentation, I have no disclosures related to this presentation. Uh, and so when thinking about sexual dysfunction or sexual problems after cancer tre treatment, you know, really kind of what is it that we usually see? What usually um, are those types of things that, that we see most frequently? And so erectile dysfunction known as uh, ED is definitely one of the things that we uh, see the most after cancer treatments. Uh, depending on what type of cancer treatment, depending on uh, kind of where the treatment is, is focused, um, often see erectile dysfunction. Um, sometimes we see difficulty reaching orgasm. Um, a lot of times this might happen. Uh, there are some treatments for prostate cancer that lower testosterone, which, which are potentially related to difficulty reaching orgasm. But we see it in other cancers as well, potentially related to types of treatment, potentially related to fatigue, uh, and other aspects. Dry orgasm, um, often seen a lot of times after prostate cancer treatments, but other cancer treatments as well. That's where, where a man has an orgasm, but nothing comes out. There's no ejaculate. Uh, sometimes we see painful orgasms uh, are painful ejaculation. Um, sometimes orgasm-associated urine leak. And so um, instead of ejaculate coming out, sometimes there's, ur uh, there's a bit of urine leak. Um, you know, for some treatments, we do see penile length alterations as well. Um, we might see kind of a loss in length or potential loss in girth. Uh, penile curvature is something we see sometimes, uh, also what's known as Peyronie's disease. It's, a, it's something that happens where scar tissue builds up in, in the shaft of the penis, and what happens when the penis becomes erect, blood flows into the penis. It doesn't actually kind of be able to throw through, flow through that scar tissue, so the penis might uh, bend our curve around it, and so we see that at times. Um, and low sexual desire, um, oftentimes we see that related to a host of cancer treatments. So things like chemotherapy, radiation, after surgery, oftentimes we'll see low sexual desire. And of course, these things can all be related to each other. Um, sometimes low sexual desire is related to difficulty with erections, and that can be related to difficulty reaching orgasm. And so those are intensive after cancer treatments. Those are the things that we, we typically see. And then in terms of transplant recipient, recipients, so what causes sexual problems in this group? And so, um, you know, things like high-dose chemotherapy or total body radiation, you know, can have an impact. Obviously, it's their systemic treatments, and so they can have a, an impact, um, you know, kind of throughout the body. And so even things like hair loss, risk of infection, uh, loss of, of interest. This, again, if you're fatigued and feeling tired, you might feel loss of interest or sexual desire. Sometimes this can have an impact on, on erections, chronic fatigue, and possible nerve damage, depending on the type of treatment. Um, graft uh, versus host disease can cause things like in inflammation um, on the genital skin, uh, changes like things like redness and rash, Sometimes the narrowing of, narrowing of the urethra and steroids can affect body image. And so there, there might be kind of a host of reasons why um, treatment, you know, after transplant um, might impact sexual functioning. And so, the, you know, part of the question is, so how often does this occur? Um, 
after BMT, after transplant? Well, you know, what, what's the frequency of these type of problems? Um, and so I'll review some of the research with you. There's, there's three or four slides. Uh, we tried not to, to have these uh, appear academic in nature, but the hope is that it, it provides some information in terms of what we see in, uh, related to sexual dysfunction after cancer treatments. And so this is a study in um, just about 1,000 male survivors, um, you can see, of uh, a transplant. And so on average, they're 11 years after treatment. So this is quite a long time after treatment. So some of these, treat some of these treatments can have lasting impact on, on sexual functioning. So 27 uh, were not sexually active during the past year, and that's lower than the general population. Uh, 30, about 30, so 31.5, we'll call it 32% reported problems with sexual functioning. That's pretty general, kind of where those problems were, where an erectile dysfunction was the most frequently reported, about 38%. Um, and then 20, about 24% reported a lack of interest. Um, and then lower sexual function was associated with, th with things like worse physical, emotional, and relationship health. And so you can imagine that, number one, if you're not feeling as well uh, physically, uh, that can have an impact on sexual functioning. And then if, if it has an impact on sexual functioning, you can imagine that can have an emotional impact as well. And so these things, again, can be related to each other. Um, in other studies, what we've seen, so risk factors associated with, risk factors related or, or um, associated with sexual inactivity. So problems were far more common in survivors who also reported poor physical health and other characters, uh, characteristics of those who are sexually inactive, things like older age, uh, not in a committed relationship, unemployed or not in school, less than four years of college, um, and certain types of transplant. And so we see things that potentially related um, not only to treatment, but might be related to sexual functioning as well. Um, in this study, this is sexual functioning in 100, about 160 men um, of lymphoma patients after uh, autologous stem tra cell transplant. And here, kind of the, looks like about 40% uh, overall reported sexual problems, 43% uh, sexual drive problems. Um, and so that sexual interest, um, your libido, um, your sexual desire, 30% had sexual drive only a few days or less than uh, or less in the last month. And so, and that is, if you only have sexual desire, a few days in a month, um, that is pretty low, uh, and that would be considered something to be potentially kind of look for, help or look for treatment uh, about. And so 54% had erectile problems, 41% had erections firm enough to have sexual intercourse only a few times or less in the last month. And so, you know, um, and so if you look at the general population, that number comes in in terms of erectile problems you know, around 20 to 25 percent, and, and the 54 percent is clearly elevated compared to the general population. Um, and only 39 percent reported sexual satisfaction. So you're seeing definitely an impact um, of this type of treatment, of these type of treatments uh, on sexual functioning. And so, you know, it's interesting. And so we, we see this across cancer treatments. So this is very common after cancer, very common after cancer treatments. And so really the question is, so what? I mean, so this is a problem, and, and why do we care? Because here's what, here's what patients tell me that they hear, right? And so patients hear this from other people related to difficulties with sexual functioning. And what they hear is this. It's like, well, you know, at your age, does it really matter? Right, and so like think about that. What it's like to you know to kind of hear that, um, or you know you shouldn't be upset. Your cancer is gone, or well you know you'll just get used to it. And so ultimately, though, kind of kind of why this is important is you know sexual dysfunction really can have an impact on your life, and you know for men things like erectile dysfunction, ED can have a significant impact on your life. And we know now from studies um, and from my clinical experience that erectile dysfunction is associated with depressive symptoms. And there are some studies which, which indicate that as many as 50% of men who report erectile dysfunction also report depressive symptoms. 
depressive symptoms enough that they would warrant an evaluation. And so we do see an impact um, basically on depressive symptoms. Another way to think about it is just general quality of life. Um, we see an impact not only on kind of the general quality of life in the bedroom, but we also see it kind of across kind of life in other aspects of life. Um, we also know concerns about erectile dysfunction don't go away over time, right? One of the comments on the previous slides was like, you know, don't worry about it, you'll get used to it. Well, actually it turns out men don't get used to it. Um, and, and this can impact uh, the quality of life and general happiness. And it's interesting, there's no, no logical predictors. Oftentimes we think that those men who'd be most distressed are those ones who were, you know, more, more sexually active, um, more sexually interested be, before the treatment. And it turns out that it doesn't really matter kind of in terms of your sexual activity or your sexual, sexual interest pre-treatment, kind of all men tend to be upset. Um, and this tends to hit all men. Essentially what kind of the difficulties with sexual functioning, here we're specifically talking about erectile dysfunction, tends to go to, a, you know, to the core of what it is to be a man. Men report it as, as it just kind of hits them in like kind of a sense of who they are as a man. Uh, one man talked about it as they kind of pulled the rug out from under him or the ground that he walked on since he was a teenager. And so there's no doubt that these types of difficulties and problems can have an impact uh, kind of on men's general happiness, on their mood, and also kind of this last bullet on their relationships. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, um, but often, not oftentimes, but sometimes what happens with men is they have difficulty with erections. They pull back from kind of all either intimate contact or all contact from their partner. And I've heard this enough from men that I know that basically the phrase they use is, is what's, what's the use of getting close to my partner? What's the use of having close intimate contact? Because if something starts, I can't finish. And then what that leads to is a pulling away, a withdrawing from the partner. And ultimately that's when the conflict can start and that's when we start seeing relationship difficulties. And so kind of in terms of after uh, bone marrow transplant treatment. We know that sexual dysfunction can be a problem. Erectile dysfunction is probably the most frequently reported. And we know that this is actually associated with things like depressed mood, distress, uh, and relationship difficulties. And so the good news about this is that we can help. There's actually treatments available. And this is actually one area where there's, uh, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a, lot of, a lot of hope related to the treatments. Um, some, some side effects after treatments, it's, it's difficult to treat those. It's difficult to kind of manage those. Here, we actually have some pretty good treatments. Um, and so in terms of erectile dysfunction, again, the thing that we see the most or the problems that we see most, mostly reported the most, what are some possible treatments for erectile dysfunction? And so let me run through these, and, and then um, we can certainly have, have questions about these Kind of after I'm done, we can certainly talk more about this, but possible treatments for erectile dysfunction. So there's the pills, right? There's the Viagra, the Levitra, Cialis. And for, for a good portion of men, these pills hopefully <clears throat> will work pretty well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the pills are, are generally the first line treatment. Um, they're, depending on the treatment that you've had, depending on the impact, the pills, again, the, Vi the Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, may not work. Um, if they don't work, there are other options. And so <clears throat> the second option is penile injections. And uh, usually if I, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting this to an audience, I, I can see them, I say kind of, I, you know, I have people raise hands who've heard of penile injections and about, you know, half the audience has, has heard of them and half the audience hasn't. But ultimately... Um, these are kind of, as it says, it's actually injections into the shaft of the penis. It's a type of medication called a vasodilator that's injected in the penis and it pulls blood into the penile tissue. And actually it's really effective to producing erections. It's probably the most consistent, most reliable treatment there is for erections. Of course, the difficulty is, is you think about penis and injections and those, those two words don't really go in the same sentence, right? Penis and injection. It turns out that actually the injections, um, it's a very thin needle and pain on injection depends on the thickness of the needle. So the thinner the needle, the less pain, the thicker the needle, the more pain. And so it's a very thin needle 
and the injections themselves turn out to be actually not so painful. Um, it's kind of like getting a flu shot. Um, and whenever I get a flu shot, you know, I kind of, I, I, sometimes I don't even feel the needle going. It's such a thin needle. It's very similar to that. And we've actually, um, we've actually asked men, um, like on a zero to 10 scale, tell, tell me how painful the injection is, right? So they use the injections for the first time. Then we ask them on a zero to 10, 10, 10 point scale to rate the pain of that injection, zero being no pain, 10 being pain as bad as you can imagine. Now, before the injections, and as you're thinking, like that pain has to be like a 9 or a 10. Some, some people say it's got to be off the chart. It's got to be like a 12. Turns out that after the injection, when we ask men, the pain scale, generally men either report a 0, no pain, uh, a 1 or a 2, but very minimal pain. So in terms of injections themselves, not very painful, but a very actually reliable, consistent, good treatment for erections. There's also uh, something called vacuum devices uh, that goes over the penis and it creates a vacuum which pulls blood into the penis and then once the blood is in the penis and it's erect, then you put a, a ring uh, around the shaft of the penis to kind of keep that blood in there. Um, and the vacuum uh, devices, um, there's some men who, who actually really, kind of really appreciate and, and use the, the vacuum devices and, and, and find that they work really well. Um, and so it's a little bit of trial and error, but there's certainly some men who use them who really like them. There's also uh, something called Muse, which is a tablet, which is also uh, the similar medication to the PL injections. It's what's called a vasodilator. And that tablet, you actually insert it actually into the urethra, um, and you push it down in the urethra a little bit. The, the medication is dissolved then, and that produces an erection. <clears throat> and so for those... For the pills, the penile injections, the vacuum devices, the muse, kind of, you know, this is the order in how you would try them. And so generally you try the pills first. If they don't work, then you'd move to something like the penile injections, vacuum devices, or the muse, and you try those, you know, you try kind of a combination or, or one of those, um, and if one doesn't work, then you move to another. If all of these don't work, um, then the, the, the option in, in um, you know, final option is a penile implant. And so I will say kind of the penile implant tends to work really well. And men who have an implant or men who've, you know, kind of gone through and tried the pillows, tried the injections, haven't really had satisfactory results. And so they move to the penile implant. And the satisfaction of the penile implant generally is very high. If you look at kind of the satisfaction data, men are reporting kind of 95 to 96 to 97, 98 percent of men very satisfied with the penal implant, and so there are options available, um, and certainly things that you know are there and good options for you. And just here's a few pictures of a few things. Kind of this first picture um, is is the vacuum device where where you would put this uh, kind of over over your penis, and in this one is you the vacuum, you would just pump the vacuum. They actually have battery-operated uh, vacuum devices now in a ring that would go kind of over the base of the penis. Um, the second kind of uh, lower kind of in, in, I guess in my slides, little left-hand corner, the Muse, um, it kind of shows kind of the insertion of a tablet into the urethra. And then kind of on the right, the third picture is a picture of, of the implant, and it would, in it's basically these cylinders are implanted in the shaft of the penis, um, and this reservoir is best, basically sits in the scrotum. And then when a man in this reservoir holds either water or saline, when a man wants an erection, he, he um, basically pumps, pumps that reservoir, pumps that up. The, the water or saline moves from the reservoir. It goes into these cylinders producing an erection. Um, and then when a man wants to kind of be flaccid again, um, there is basically this, um, this, uh, this lever here. You press it, the, the water or saline moves um, from these cylinders back into the reservoir and the man's flaccid. And so those are the treatments for erectile dysfunction. If you see a urologist, um, clearly kind of your general practitioner can help. A urologist or even the best would be a, to be a, see a urologist who's a sexual medicine specialist kind of really knows these treatments well uh, and can help you with these treatments. And so that's the good news. The good news is we have treatments available and they're there and ultimately they can work really well. And if you keep on trying, you know, in general, most men 
95% of men find something that works. Um, so the difficulty is, though, is that men can avoid or drop out of ED treatment. And, and the data on this is actually pretty striking. And so um, here's some data. So men drop out of treatment. And so PDE5 users, so kind of there's the first bullet, bullet there that says men drop out of treatment. And then right below it says 50% of PDE5 users. Sorry, that's a little technical. Instead of PDE5, those are pills. The PDE5Is are... Um, are the pills, the Viagra Levitra Cialis. So those who use Viagra Levitra Cialis, um, 50, about 50% 50 who prescribe that um, actually drop out of treatment, do not renew their prescriptions. And so, um, so right, so that's a difficulty. We know that for most men, those will work pretty well, and 50% are renewing prescriptions. 50% of uh, injection users drop out of treatment. Um, even if you look at self-report injection use, uh, only 60% continue at four months, only 33% at the rate suggested for rehabilitation. That's something specific after prostate cancer treatments. Uh, but ultimately, there's this data about men dr dropping out of treatment, even though some of these treatments actually um, are very useful. And in fact, kind of as you try them, you probably find one that is really, really very useful that works really well, but we still see men drop out of treatment. Um, and the question is, why is this? And, and oftentimes we think it's, well, because, you know, um, the injections, men don't want to use the injections because it's painful or there's something about the pills, the side effects. But actually the research doesn't show that that really impacts it. What the research really shows is it has to do with a kind of a cycle of, of frustration and avoidance that builds up for men when they experience difficulty with erections. And the way this works is that... Um, the first part is there's disappointment and shame related to the, the ED erectile dysfunction. You know, kind of, I talked before about this notion about, man, you know, it feels like I'm not a man anymore. I'm not the person or man that I used to be. Distress and depressive symptoms. And so, kind of, as a man, as a man feels that, then there's fear and anxiety about entering into a sexual situation and not having the ability to have a natural or a firm erection. And kind of in the qualitative research that we've done, we've asked men, what's it like to enter into such a sexual situation when you're not confident in your erection? Um, and men will say it's fear, like I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, because if I don't perform, right, and I'm not successful, I feel humiliated. Um, I, feel like, I feel like I'm a failure. And then that basically that fear and anxiety also is, you know, this notion of having to use treatments is potentially kind of a turnoff. Um, our men report that the whole process is humiliating. So all this builds into the fear and anxiety about entering a sexual situation. And if you're nervous about something, you're fearful about something, you're more likely to avoid it. And so you, there's an avoidance of the sexual situation. Then what happens is there's a loss of value life experience. And then that just increases the frustration, the, the distress and depression. Um, and so this type of avoidance, this type of cycle avoidance, we see a lot when men have difficulty with erections and they need to use some type of treatment to help with erections. And so just looking at the cycle and thinking about here's this kind of mapped out in, in an actual cycle format. And what happens is, is at the stop, at the, at the, at the top here, men start with like the, they start thinking about the problem. Problem is erectile dysfunction and need to use ED treatment. And then that leads to negative thoughts. I'm not a man. Um, I will not be able to finish. I will not be able to succeed. Treatments are unnatural. And those thoughts then lead to an emotional reaction. Again, this notion of increased anxiety, fear about sexual situation, um, and the fear of kind of having to use the treatments. Is it going to work? Is it not? And then kind of that leads to avoidance. And if you think about it, so if you think, okay, you know, tonight, you know, maybe something has happened. So I'm going to try some pills tonight to, to help with my erections. I'm going to try an injection tonight to help with my erections. Um, and you start to become nervous and anxious about that. If you think about that, then what happens if you're thinking about that, okay, what happens tonight? And you're nervous and anxious and you say to yourself, okay, well, wait, you know, I'm just, I'm just not going to do it tonight. I'm going to put it off to the next night. I'm going to put it off to next, next week. As soon as you do that, as soon as you put it off, that's like an instant reaction to help lower your anxiety. It's like an instant mechanism. As soon as you avoid, as soon as you put it off, you're not feeling anxious anymore about it because you don't have to do it that night. Um, so there is, there is relief. There's a short-term relief 
that quickly then then turns the anxiety and fear the next day because you thought, boy, I was going to do that. I was I was going to try something and now I haven't, and now I'm feeling more anxious. I, like again, I'm 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 not having I'm not entering into kind of a valued life experience, which only then feeds into the problem, and so we see this cycle of avoidance. And so, even though there's really good treatments out there. Um, oftentimes men avoid even thinking about them, talking about them, or using them. And so, um, so on this slide then, so, um, so this is stereotypes. This slide is about stereotypes. And I just want to focus on the top. Like there's this notion that men are always in the on position, right? There's a stereotype. And, and maybe kind of if a man doesn't have difficulty with erections, maybe that's true. Um, but as soon as a man has some difficulty with erections, Actually, they're not, they're not necessarily in the on position anymore. Actually, matter of fact, they may be in the off position because of this nervous, this nervousness, this sense of anxiety, the sense of dread about entering into a sexual situation. And so basically kind of the idea then is how can you engage in treatments? What kind of, what advice can I give you? What, how do I talk to patients about engaging in treatments and being able to follow through on these treatments? So you can, so you can uh, engage in these treatments and hopefully uh, get back into sexual relations or, or a sex life. And so how to come overcome the avoidance? And so one is this is coaching. It's not therapy. But start with kind of exploring the importance of sexuality. Like why is it important for you to get your erections back? And men have different reasons for this. Some men say, because I just want to be whole again. Some men say, I just want to know that I can. Like, I just want to be able to function. Some men say, I just want to feel like a man again. Some men say, it's important to my relationship. Some men are single and say, it's important to dating. And so there's a number of different reasons, but it's important for you to think about kind of why it's important for you. And then after you do that, accept short-term anxiety for a long-term goal. That is kind of, this says, listen to patients' predictions about sexual experience, but you'll have some predictions then about sexual experience. Like maybe I, I don't know how I'm going to do. I'm, am I, I might be anxious. I might, might not work. But ultimately, the notion is, is that you're going to be nervous and anxious as you're trying these treatments, and you might be nervous and anxious as you enter a sexual situation. And it's kind of a, a willingness to accept that. Okay, I know I'm going to be nervous. It's not going to kill me. I'm going to do it anyways because if I try these treatments, then hopefully that that even though I'm sure in the short term I'll be anxious, hopefully in the long term what happens is they're successful and I'm able to, um, to use these treatments. I'm able to engage in sexual relations again. It's basically a willingness to experience anxiety and frustration. Um, oftentimes diffusing anxiety and frustration is helpful. Kind of emotional processing, that's just a technical way of saying um, talking about it or at least thinking about it. Sometimes talking it over with someone is helpful. Um, humor. Using humor, men often, often use humor in these situations. Many men find that it's actually helpful. And then focusing on the physical sensations in the sexual situation. Um, think about barriers that, that you, will, you, will kind of, um, you will put up for yourself to not follow through on what those solutions are, and then make a commitment to actually doing it. And so coming back to a cycle. So this is the cycle of acceptance and commitment. And so here, instead of starting with the problem, as the previous cycle, here you want to start with kind of the values, goals, why it's important to you. Again, it's improved sexual function, intimacy, relationships. Then a notion of acceptance, a notion of that accept that you will potentially and probably will be anxious as you're trying these treatments, as you're entering into sexual situations. Um, and a willingness to accept that anxiety um, as something that's just part of the process and do it anyway. So willingness to accept the anxiety and fear in the sexual situation, and then using the treatments in any way. Here's diffusion. Things like self-talk are helpful, no pain, no gain, use of humor. Um, these are things that kind of men report have been helpful. And then the notion is to, again, even though you're nervous and anxious, to try to move into action and engage anyway. Engage in situations and are using the pills, are using injections, because ultimately the only way you're going to figure it out is through experience and through trying. So as you try it, there's some growth, hopefully. Um, there's increased in intimacy. You may learn, you may learn that, um, that you know, something, some type of pills work, some type don't, some type of treatments work, some type, 
some types don't. But the only way you're going to learn that is through the experience. And then hopefully there's then a commitment um, to keep going, which increases life flexibility, moving towards an important goal. And so, um, and so, uh, and then, so, so that's kind of the notion of avoidance and, and hopefully working through that avoidance. And then hopefully then maintaining sexual relationships and kind of on the relationship aspect, what are things that you can do? And so, uh, you know, the impact of sexual dysfunction on relationships, you know, it, it, it can be significant. And, you know, um, in a previous slide, I talked about this. So men with ED tend to withdraw from their partner. And so, um, you know, may fear they cannot perform. Um, and, and so ultimately, again, it's this withdrawing from the partner. If a man says, you know, uh, you know, um, geez, uh, you, this notion of, you know, what's the use of getting started if I can't finish? And so what happens is men tend to withdraw not only from intimacy in the bedroom, but other kind of non, um, non-sexual intimacy. So the things like sitting together on the couch or holding hands or hugging or kissing goodbye or spending time together, there's a tendency for men to withdraw from that, again, with this notion of what's the use of getting anything started if I can't finish? And my experience working with couples is that um, for, for the female partner, um, it's, it's not kind of the reduction in sexual frequency where the conflict starts. It's actually the reduction in the non-sexual intimacy. It's the pulling away from those non-sexual intimacy moments where the female partner just thinks, boy, they're just pulling away. They're not even here anymore. They're not even interacting with me anymore. And in a relationship, that tends to be when the distress starts. Um, partner may fear uh, setting patient up for failure and also pull back, which happens as well. If, if the partner has a sense that you're nervous um, uh, or kind of there's, there's a sense of fear on your part, uh, the partner may pull back as well because they don't necessarily want to put you in that situation or, or put themselves in the situation. And a lot of times there's kind of like a he said, she said, and oftentimes men and women communicate differently about this. And so, you know, many times what happens is that the, the female partner will say, you know, it's okay. Like, uh, you know, what's most important for me, the female partner says, is that you, the patient, is still, is still around that you're still alive. Um, I'm not so worried about uh, erections or, or sexual intercourse. And so women are trying to be supportive, but what men hear, men hear is that, wait a minute, you, you don't care about that? That's, that's an important piece to me. That's an important piece of what it is to be a man. And, and oftentimes take that as, you don't care about me, you're not interested. And then there's a communication just on different levels where she's trying to be supportive and a man is saying, you don't really care about me or, you know, I don't necessarily really believe you. Um, and ultimately, they're communicating on different levels. So what's definitely important is as you talk about it um, with your partner to kind of to talk about these things, to know about this dynamic and try not to be talking on different levels, but trying to talk enough um, and figuring out enough where you can talk on the same level. And so some strategies to help with that. Um, and so these are... You know, I talked about the kind of the pharmacological solutions. Here are some non-pharmacological strategies to improve sexual relationships. And so there's an exercise called sensate focus. And this is really about coming together, you and your partner, without the stress of having to have an erection or without the stress of intercourse. And essentially, there's three steps. The first step is to come together and it's basically massage um, but in, in this step, things like genital area and breasts um, are not in play and then are not the focus. And as you come together and massage, um, the idea is to just enjoy the physical touch. Um, you can massage with clothes on, massage with clothes off. You can massage in the shower. Um, you know, uh, you can massage with oil. Um, but the hope then is, is to come together and the focus in and actually, the goal is not to have an erection or not to have intercourse, but just to come together in a way where you can enjoy physical touch again. You can do that. Um, it depends on the couple. Some couples do that, you know, five, six, seven times. Uh, some couples do it two or three. Before you move on to the next step, which is step two, 
where um, where uh, breasts and genital um, genital regions of the body are in play, but still there's not a focus on erection, there's not a focus on intercourse, and, and there's no focus on orgasm. And so, um, so, so you're not supposed to move to, to erections, intercourse, or orgasm, but again, just enjoy the touch, enjoy being together, where breasts and the genital areas are, are allowable in play. And the idea is to do that um, a few times. Some, some couples do it two or three times. Some couples do it four or five times. But coming together, we are not focused on erections, intercourse, or orgasm. Step three is basically the same thing, but you're allowed to move then to orgasm. Again, the pressure isn't necessarily erections. Um, it turns out that men can have an erection, can have, have, have an orgasm even if they don't have an erection. Um, but the notion is to kind of, through sensei focus, to go step by step, to progressively get into something uh, a little bit more sexual, but ultimately taking the pressure off having to have an erection or having to have, having to have intercourse. Oftentimes, it's, it's good to set some time aside to talk about uh, intimate to topics and, and have intimate conversations to make sure you're taking the time to talk about this. Sometimes what happens in terms of sexual desire is sometimes what happens or what's helpful in terms of sexual desire is keeping a desire diary, um, indicating kind of when kind of you kind of uh, your desire is the highest and then that is the, the time to take in terms of uh, sexual relations or sexual intercourse. Self-stimulation can be helpful in all of this, especially try when trying the ED treatments. Trying it on your own with, sometimes reduces the stress and anxiety of having to try it with a partner, and oftentimes that's helpful. Now, self-stimulation, even kind of mutual self-stimulation with a partner is helpful sometimes in relationships where it takes the pressure off of erection or intercourse uh, and can be helpful in, in relationships. And then consulting with a sex therapist or a psychologist who does specialize um, in some type of uh, intimacy work or, or sexual functioning work can be really helpful for couples. Um, and oftentimes this takes, you know, really kind of one, two, three, four sessions. This is not long-term uh, meeting with a therapist. This is generally short-term. Most couples are helped after two or three treatments. Um, and generally, couples report that it's very helpful to open up the conversation about these topics and then to discuss practical strategies on how to move forward. In terms of resources that can help, and so referral resources, and so um, resources that can help um, uh, if you're looking for things like um, psychologists who specialize in, in, in working with sexual issues or sex therapists, there's a Society of Sex Therapy and Research STAR, and on their website, um, they should have links, and they do have links to referrals in specific regions. Also, the American Association of Sexuality Education Counselors and Therapists, it's called ASEC, on their website, they also have referrals within specific regions um, to, again, sex therapists, sex counselors, or psychologists who specialize in this area. Another really good source of information is the American Cancer Society website. And you can search things like questions adult males have about cancer and sex, sex in the adult male with cancer. And they review topics, um, answer questions, review these type of treatments, review kind of non-pharmacological treatments. Um, and it's actually kind of something that I've helped write and put together. Um, so at least for me, I think it's good, and I, I, I vetted it, and, and it's important. So these are important resources, hopefully, to help kind of be on this presentation. And, um, and ultimately, this is just my last slide. And, and so this is, <laughs> this, is, this is something that was uh, taken to Safeway, a supermarket, right? And it's supposed to say, pen is broken, please use finger. Um, and it's exclamation point, but it, um, it actually turns out to be read, penis is broken, please use finger, exclamation point, thanks. And, and, and the reason I bring this up is not only because it's funny, but because um, in general kind of my experience is, is if, if penis is broken to some extent, men don't want to use their finger. They, they want to actually kind of have some type of treatments that can help um, give their erections back. We have those treatments. Um, and... And it's a challenge then to kind of 
push forward and to talk to a physician about those treatments, knowing that there might be some avoidance to using them, there might be some type of psychological disappointment that's happening that's leading to avoidance. But if you work through it, you can definitely be successful. Um, and if you keep trying, you can definitely be successful. And so my message just to you is that um, even though sexual dysfunction is prevalent after these treatments, uh, we have ways to help with that. And if you keep trying, and if you keep trying, um, you know, hopefully you'll be successful. So, so thank you for listening. Uh, we have moved on to questions, and uh, happy to take some questions um, and answer. So, well, thank you, Dr. Nelson. Excellent presentation, particularly the last slide. That was very funny. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Good. We Good. we will now take questions. Uh, as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, the first question that we have from uh, one of the questioners is, does neuropathy contribute to ED? Mm. So, you know, it, it, so, so the answer is a, a bit it depends. And so, but neuropathy, what neuropathy can do is it potentially, potentially can impact the nerves kind of on the penis. And so what it might do is potentially um, basically lose the sensation on the penis and the penile tissue. And so kind of things that were enjoyable, whether it was physical touch, uh, oral, um, whatever it was, um, might not be as enjoyable. And because of that, um, you might have more difficulty with erections. There might not anything, be anything mechanically wrong in terms of producing erection. It just might have to do with kind of a loss of a loss of some physical sensation around in, on the penis, in the penis, um, in the skin, in the penis. All right. What is the procedure for testing testosterone level? Is testosterone replacement safe? Mm -hmm. So the procedure is is that you would um, you would talk to your doctor if if you're thinking about this. I would go to someone who specializes in testosterone replacement, and so there are those doctors out there. Um, so there's uh, some sexual medicine professionals that, again, those are urologists who specialize in sexual medicine. Many of those will actually have a lot of experience with testosterone and testosterone replacement. There's endocrinologists who also potentially might do testosterone replacement. The test for testosterone is really very easy. So it's a blood test. Um, and so if you're getting some other tests done in a day, they can actually add the, te the, the test for testosterone. Um, technically, you should, it should be done in the morning, um, preferably before noon, um, and you know, hopefully even before 10 or 11, but ultimately the best tests for testosterone are in the morning. Um, and there are, um, there are a number of testosterone replacement treatments or therapies. And so are they safe? The, the general answer is yes, they're safe. And if you have low testosterone because of your treatment, you, to replace your testosterone and get your testosterone back up to normal can, can actually help you um, physically feel a, little bit, feel a lot better, emotionally can help you feel better. Um, it, it's just uh, kind of, it would be potentially beneficial. Um, and so the options are out there and definitely kind of meet with someone to talk about the options and, and how that can happen. But I definitely encourage you to pursue that treatment. Excellent. We have another ED question here. What type of doctor is the best type to treat ED? Yeah. And so like, um, so it's in kind of the, the sexual medicine specialist. So it's, it's a type of urologist. So, so be in the category of urologist and within urology, there's a specialty, which is called sexual medicine. And so these doctors are really the best to treat um, erectile dysfunction. They'll have the best knowledge of kind of all of these treatments that I've talked about, um, they'll be able to help you out in terms of what's the most appropriate for you. If one doesn't work, they'll be able then to go to the next treatment um, and really kind of, you know, kind of they're the best doctors to really kind of work with this. They know their stuff. All right. Um, we have a couple of questions here related to personal uh, experience. One is, mm -hmm. I never experienced these issues. Can I expect problems later? 
three years, three months post-transplant, 71 years old, non-Hodgkin's autologous transplant. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you haven't experienced them yet, that's probably a good sign. That's probably a good predictor that you, in terms of, you know, in terms of the treatment, that they probably won't have a major impact on your sexual functioning moving forward. And so uh, that's certainly a good sign. I don't want you to think ahead and expect that they happen, so you kind of talk yourself into them most likely, uh, hopefully, in terms of, at least in terms of the impact from the treatment, you should be okay. All right, here's uh, another personal uh, question. I'm 57 years old and one year post-transplant. Before transplant, I had taken sildenafil and experienced headaches and mild vision issues. Now, post-transplant, I recently, 45 days ago, began taking uh, Norvasc. This blood pressure medication was issued as a result of an increased dosage of Jacophy. Uh, taking ED meds seems contrary to taking blood pressure meds. I welcome your thoughts. Yeah, so definitely talk it over with your doctor. Um, and for this one, I, I might go to, I might specifically seek out a sexual medicine professional because they'll be able, they'll, they'll have better knowledge in terms of in terms of the, the ability to take something like uh, the Cialis, right? And, and all, the, all those types of pills medications are very similar. So Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, they're all very similar. And so have, you know, a similar what's called side effect profile. Um, but you'd want to talk it over with someone who really knows kind of if it's dangerous or not. And so um, you can talk it over with your general doctor. Your general doctor may just dismiss it out of hand. Is without having some good knowledge about it, a sexual medicine professional would have better knowledge and be able to tell you if, yes, you can, it would be safe, or no, you can't. Um, if you can't take that, take a pill, like I said, there's other treatments, and I would really encourage you, even though um, even though you're saying, I don't know if I can try injections, I would really encourage you to, to seek out um, and try them if, in fact, the pills aren't an option for you. The injections, again, tend to produce really kind of very, very reliable, very rigid, rigid erections. They're, they're really kind of the most consistent treatment there is. Yeah. Is it safe to have intercourse with ejaculation while undergoing chemo treatment and thinking of for the patient and for the partner? Yeah, kind of while you're going through chemo, I think you'd want to um, you'd, you'd want to refrain potentially from, um, from, from intercourse and ejaculation. So you could use a condom. Um, but like during, during chemo, in, in the, basically the jury's kind of out on this, but to be safe, I think during chemo, um, using a condom or refraining from intercourse, um, would, would probably be best. All right. Um, another, uh, personal, uh, question had a transplant 34 years ago, now have prostate cancer have been mm -hmm. dysfunctional for years, but now I'm uh, incontinent and I'm less willing to try. Any suggestions? Yeah, and so, right, so common after prostate cancer is uh, incontinence. And so, um, so a few things. So there's, there's two things you probably want to, you probably want to target. So one is the incontinence and, and one is um, the sexual dysfunction or it sounds like difficulty with erections. And so, um, there are, so, so as there are urologists who specialize in sexual dysfunction, there's urologists who specialize in, in things like urinary, um, urinary incontinence. And so there's, there's urologists who specialize in that. And so I would, um, my suggestion would go to, go to see each one of those. And so, um, there's potentially, tr um, treatments, either kind of medication you can take or other interventions that can help with the incontinence. Um, and then kind of as I talked about, there's treatments and other, you know, things that can help with erectile dysfunction. Um, but there are specialists in both of those areas. Uh, and in general, patients find it really helpful to go see them. And so I would definitely encourage um, seeking out both those specialists. Thank you. This questioner wants to know, um, this questioner is five years post-transplant. Uh, as 72 and lost all libido. Is this common? Any suggestions on how to treat it? 
Yeah, and so um, definitely can be common, um, you know, potentially after transplant and also kind of as men age, um, you know, they lose about 10% of testosterone per decade. So it's, it's common for your testosterone basically to go down as, as a man ages. And so, um, yes, there's potentially something that can be done about it is, is um, there are treatments to replace testosterone. Um, and so good to kind of get it checked again and, um, you know, pursue that type of treatment for testosterone replacement. Again, the, the places to go for that would be, you know, sexual medicine professionals uh, and are an endocrinologist, but you'd want to look to see for someone who actually has experience with testosterone replacement and something that they do in their in their clinical practice. Um, but there's there's uh, there's many men in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that find uh, significant benefit for testosterone replacement. Um, there's ways to do it. There's medications out there, um, and it's it's a discussion with with, you know, again, probably with a sexual medicine specialist or endocrinologist who specialize in this and whether it's appropriate for you. Okay. Are sexual function problems permanent? Are you ever able to go back to normal sexual activity like pre-transplant? So it would, you know, it depends on exactly kind of what the sexual, sexual problem is um, and how it's manifested itself. And so... There are times where difficulty with erections might be related primarily to anxiety. That's kind of men's just, men's just very nervous and anxious about entering a sexual situation with a partner. Um, and because of that, kind of they become, um, you know, kind of uh, hypersensitive to their erections, right? They become hyper-focused on their erections. And they, you know, as they enter a sexual situation, they're, they're kind of cataloging, you know, is it, so is my, you know, what's my erection like? Is it getting hard? Is it not getting hard? And, um, if it's kind of, and then what happens, it leads to anxiety. And then anxiety, basically, once kind of um, the anxiety adrenaline hits your, your bloodstream, it's like a potent anti-erection agent. Um, kind of uh, adrenaline's purpose is to pull blood from non-vital organs to vital organs. And so, unfortunately, adrenaline doesn't think that the penis is a vital organ, so it'll pull blood from the penile tissue into the vital organs. So, you know, ultimately, if... If something like it's anxiety driven, there are ways definitely to overcome that. And then um, once you do, your body will start to work naturally and, and you can recover. Um, if the impact of the treatments is more physical uh, and has a physical impact, you may or may not recover um, the sexual functioning. Um, and it just depends on exactly what the sexual function or dysfunction is, um, kind of the type of treatment you've had. Um, and it really, you know, it would be kind of a much more individual conversation to, to go through that. All right. This uh, questioner says uh, that he takes two blood pressure medications daily uh, and is also taking oxycodone due to bone pain. I know opioids can affect sexual function, but will blood pressure medication affect ED as well? You know, in general, in general, no. In general, blood pressure medication is not necessarily related to, to difficulty with erections. Um, so, uh, in general, no. But, you know, again, if you're having problems, um, you definitely want to reach out to someone to talk about it, like, again, a sexual medicine professional. Um, yeah, but in general, the blood pressure medications don't necessarily impact erections. Does exercise help your sex drive? So yes, and so exercise is good, right? So exercise, baseline is just exercise is good for a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, if you're feeling like, you know, your kind of libido is a little down, your sex drive's a little down, uh, erections are okay, but not as good as they used to, but you're feeling like you're kind of not in the shape you used to be, um, lifestyle interventions can be effective and can work, and exercise is an important piece of it. And so, um, so... Yeah, the exercise has the benefit of potentially helping things like your arousal, your libido, um, potentially helping erections, so it's good. Um, but then exercise has a whole bunch of other benefits, right? It, you kind of feel better about yourself. It helps you cope with the side effects of treatments. Um, there's evidence that it helps cognitive functioning. Like exercise is a good thing, and so um, 
So I would definitely support exercise and, and physical, getting in physical shape and kind of lifestyle, you know, those lifestyle type interventions, kind of how you eat um, to help kind of you as a whole person, but also, you know, potentially to help things like your libido. And, and there is some research which shows that kind of it can help your erections too. Great. We only have time for one last question. Uh, just got a couple minutes left, so here's the sure. last one. Uh, sometimes I can get an erection, but it seems only to last a short time before I go soft. The blood drains out. Is there anything I can do? Yeah, so this is, um, so you want to, yeah, so this you definitely want to see a sexual medicine professional for, and he can he or she can can run a test to see basically what's happening um, kind of with kind of the mechanism that clamps down on that blood once it enters the penile tissue. And so, um, so you know, it, if, if basically if, if the blood flows into the penile tissue but the, the penile tissue isn't clamping down, keeping that blood there, then what will happen is that you'll kind of lose the erection. Um, but you can lose that for other reasons too. That can be because of anxiety or other, you know, kind of other reasons. And so, but you, you, but you can have it assessed. You can have it checked. Um, there's a test that they can run to see kind of what's happening with the blood flow in the penis and the penile tissue to see if it's, um, to see kind of how it's functioning. And then once they determine and kind of once they have that test and the outcomes of that test, then what they can do is determine the best treatment to help get your erections back. Um, so um, first step, sexual medicine professional, to have an assessment um, basically to seek, you know, what's happening with the penile tissue and the penis to, to see if it's operating properly. And then they can decide on treatment from there. Excellent. Well, Dr. Nelson, thank you very much. Time has just flown by. Um, I think I can uh, speak for the, the, all, the entire audience in, in saying that uh, this was a, a very, very uh, insightful presentation. And on behalf of the BMT Infonet and our partners, thank you very much for your helpful remarks. And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions.